Gentlemen, well, it took us just about one minute to get started here. 60 seconds. Really not very long, is it? And our subject is nuclear detonations and the effects which appear within the short space of just one minute. The first minute after they're set off. An explosion, any explosion, chemical or nuclear, is by definition the sudden release of a large amount of energy. But in a nuclear reaction, we deal with unique orders of magnitude. We measure the energy in terms of the equivalent yield of thousands and millions of tons of TNT. This photo shows the fireball of a burst in a megaton, that is, the million-ton range. And within seconds, the diameter of the fireball reached better than three miles. Area covered more than eight square miles, bigger than the downtown sections of most large cities. And in less time than I need to describe it, this whole area was subjected to a temperature of several million degrees. It was hot enough to vaporize rock. And that, that intense heat, was only part of the story. Typically, the energy released in a low air burst divides approximately like this. About half of it is converted into a blast wave in air, or a shock wave through earth or water, the proportion depending on the height of the burst. A little over a third of the energy appears as thermal radiation, heat, light, and ultraviolet rays. About 5% appears as initial nuclear radiation, and the remainder as residual nuclear radiation. Now, three of these four effects appear in the first minute after the explosion. If you add them up, they total about 90%. 90% of the energy released is released in the first 60 seconds. All right, first, let's take a look at the blast effect. Harvey, I'd like you to see what happened to some houses out at the Nevada test site. Roll it, please. Now, these houses were placed at various distances from ground zero. This brick house was somewhat closer in than the frame house. The range here was the same as for the brick house, but these walls were reinforced concrete. And there is a pattern to the destruction. First, the blinding flash, a momentary pause, then an abrupt rise in air pressure, followed by high winds that force the buildings, first one way and then the other. Now, how big does the rise in pressure have to be? Well, compare it with the normal atmosphere. Under standard sea level conditions, the pressure of the air we live in is 14.7 pounds per square inch. Whatever a blast wave adds to that normal pressure is called overpressure. And it doesn't take much to cause damage to most buildings. How much overpressure would cause damage? Perhaps as little as a half a pound per square inch. Or say a total of just 15.2 pounds per square inch. And in the test we've just seen, the overpressures were many times that. Now, in addition, there is another quantity called dynamic pressure. And this is produced by a rush of air behind the blast front, a wind of hurricane speed. And all in all, it's more than enough of a huff and a puff to blow the house down. The radius of blast destruction depends on such factors as the nature of the target, the height of the burst, the size of the burst and the Mach effect. Mach. The Mach effect is a characteristic of the blast wave which extends the radius of blast damage, and it occurs as follows. The blast front forms almost immediately a rapidly expanding sphere that races away from the fireball. In the next few seconds, the blast front continues to grow, striking the ground and producing a reflected wave. And thus, we have two pressure fronts the primary and the reflected. The two fronts join together at the ground, forming a single reinforced front, which is roughly perpendicular to the ground. And this is the mock front, or stem. And its force is additive. That is, it adds together the overpressures of the primary and reflected waves. The result is an overpressure that is about twice that of the original primary blast pressure. And it was this double force traveling home. Overpressure. 
is followed by a rapid fall in pressure to a level below that of the surrounding atmosphere. And it is during this period of negative pressure or partial vacuum that the air is drawn back in towards the explosion and the winds are reversed. And this can also cause damage. Now from blast effect, let us turn our attention to the thermal radiation, which accounts for about 35% of the total energy release. Thermal radiation is emitted from the fireball in two pulses. This is the effect of the second pulse, which is made up of visible light and infrared rays. Now if we plot the emission of thermal radiation against a time scale, the first pulse would look like this. In a one megaton explosion, the first pulse lasts about a tenth of a second, and it carries about 1% of the total thermal radiation energy, mostly in the form of ultraviolet rays. But ultraviolet rays are readily attenuated in the air, so the first pulse is not a significant hazard, except, of course, to the eyes of someone who happens to be looking directly at the explosion. The second pulse, however, is another matter. As you can see from the long sloping curve, the second pulse does last for a while, about 10 seconds in a one megaton explosion. The temperatures are somewhat lower. And the radiation is emitted in the visible light and infrared ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum. This second pulse, which carries 99% of the thermal radiation energy, is the main cause of skin burns, eye injuries, and fires such as you see over here. Now, fortunately, thermal radiation travels like ordinary light in a straight line. Therefore, anything opaque, anything that casts a shadow, can offer some protection against thermal radiation. Take a look over here. Anything opaque, such as a wooden door, which casts a shadow, can offer some protection against the thermal radiation. However, a transparent material, such as this glass door, will not protect you. What about light and dark materials? Good. Yes, color is a consideration. A black surface or a dark one will absorb thermal radiation, whereas a white or a light-colored surface reflects it. And this has been demonstrated dramatically in one of the tests, a test showing a dressed mannequin after an explosion. The dress displayed is made of a patterned fabric, and notice the pattern of the dark colors in the dress. And now the same pattern was scorched into the slip. And in the case of tests on dark and light-colored buildings, which received the same amount of thermal radiation, the dark buildings burned while the light ones did not. So much for thermal radiation. The last immediate effect to be considered is the initial nuclear radiation emitted from the radioactive cloud during the first minute. And this accounts for about 5% of the total energy. It consists essentially of neutrons and gamma rays, which are like high-energy X-rays. You can't see them or hear them smell them or even feel them, but exposure to them within their effective range can be deadly. However, initial nuclear radiation is not a primary interest in a megaton-sized weapon, since the hazardous area is well within the range of severe blast and thermal damage. By the end of the first minute after a megaton burst, the fireball and the radioactive cloud surrounding it have risen several miles. No significant amounts of thermal or nuclear radiation are reaching the ground now, and the blast wave is pretty well dissipated. Thus, we've accounted for 90% of the total energy expended. The remaining 10% appears as residual nuclear radiation after the first 60 seconds, primarily in the form of radioactive fallout. But that is another chapter. Our purpose here has been to discuss only the three effects which occur in the first 60 seconds, blast, thermal, and initial nuclear radiation. Gentlemen, thank you.